Okay, great. So thanks everyone for uh, being here and thank you to the organizers for inviting me to speak. Uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about some work uh, that is contained in some of these papers. Uh, it's by now a relatively large subject, so there are many other papers uh, that are probably relevant that I haven't mentioned, but uh, at least for me, these are some of the ones that I'm going to be talking about. Um, and yeah, the, the subject for today is the large end matrix bootstrap. So how you can solve large end matrix models in the Tuft limit, okay? Um, and this is a, a sort of a very interesting subject for various reasons, and I would like to explain just one narrow motivation for doing so. So one motivation for doing so is to just to understand uh, black holes, okay? So um, we would like to understand black holes in string theory, for example, right? And uh, in order to understand black holes, well, there are two sort of basic ingredients. Uh, one is large n. Right. Uh, the reason why you need large n is because uh, the bekenstein hawking formula tells you that the area of the black hole is proportional to the entropy, and so therefore, if the entropy is very large, if the area is large, the entropy is large, uh, and therefore you need a large number of degrees of freedom. Okay. Um, and the second ingredient that we need uh, in any model of black holes is a, a strong coupling. And one reason... Uh, why black holes are strongly coupled is because they're maximally chaotic systems in the gravity approximation. Okay, so uh, these two ingredients makes black holes very difficult to solve. Right, so large n means that there are many degrees of freedom. Uh, it's very difficult to treat these numerically, uh, and strong coupling means that analytically it's very difficult to treat them. Right, because uh, nobody tells you how to use perturbation theory when the coupling is very large. Okay. So for this reason, we will need to do something more than uh, conventional analytics, right, if we want to eventually understand uh, black holes. And, uh, well, one option is to uh, do numerics. And by numerics, I specifically mean Monte Carlo. Okay, so uh, one solution uh, is to use Monte Carlo, right? I won't go into too much detail about this because uh, in part because I think Masanori will describe it more uh, in the next talk. But uh, uh, this is a very powerful general purpose tool, but there are some uh, downsides uh, to using this tool for understanding black holes. One uh, downside is uh, that, it, again, we, we are interested in systems with a large number of degrees of freedom, so numerically it's hard to do uh, Monte Carlo. Right? In particular, if we want to do some, uh, some, something where uh, n is infinite, well, in, in principle, we would have to do some extrapolation to n equals infinity. And this is somewhat unfortunate because we think that the physics is actually simplifying, right? So unlike a g generic system, uh, which may not have a nice large n limit, black holes supposedly have a lar nice large n limit, which means that as n gets larger and larger, certain physics is simplifying, but our simulation is actually getting harder. So that's a little bit awkward, right? And uh, so, so one problem uh, sort of is large n, but another... There are some more conceptual problems. So, so th this can be solved uh, in principle just by doing extrapolation, but there are some other problems that are uh, more conceptual problems. So another problem is the sign problem. Right? Sign problem, or you might say the phase problem in general. Right? So uh, in string theory, we usually have uh, systems which, involve, which are supersymmetric. So they involve both bosons and fermions, and when you have fermions, you can have a sign problem. Right? In addition, if you wanted to do some sort of Lorentzian time problems, right, so if you want to really probe, uh, for example, the out of time order correlator in order to see the, the chaos in black holes, you would need to do a Lorentzian computation. And of course, that's very difficult to do in Monte Carlo because of the sign problem. And uh, there's finally uh, one more problem, which uh, is a relatively minor problem, but still I mention it, which is the in problem of instability. So there are some problems which at least in principle, are well-defined at... Uh, this is not important. So. <laughs> so, so there are some problems which uh, are, in principle, ill-defined at finite n, but are well-defined at infinite n. Uh, and so uh, if you want to do some sort of integral, uh, direct approach to doing the integral, you will need to overcome these kind of problems. So this was just some motivation. Uh, of course, all three of these problems have been overcome in certain situations, uh, I think, as Masanori will tell us more about. Uh, so I, I definitely think Monte Carlo is an extremely important, uh, you know, technique that we should have in our toolkit. But today I'll be focusing on a sort of complementary technique, which can, uh, in principle, address these three problems uh, sort of out of the box without uh, 
you're really having to think in any hard way, okay? Uh, and that, that approach is the bootstrap, okay? So uh, that approach is the bootstrap. So um, I don't want to give a very historical uh, review, but nevertheless, I will draw this picture, which I like to draw, which is uh, an out-of-time-ordered contour. So uh, starting from, uh, let's say, the 80s, right, we had uh, the idea of using the bootstrap to solve low-dimensional CFTs, like 2D CFTs, right? Um, and uh, this was done by uh, Polyakov and many others, BPZ and many others. Mm -hmm. And of course, that led to a very interesting subject, which is now the conformal bootstrap, and we're still pursuing it today. Um, but uh, starting with uh, Anderson and Kruchensky, uh, in rel relatively more recent times, 2016, uh, we had the idea of trying to use some sort of bootstrap idea to solve large N QCD. Okay? And then uh, in Well, yeah, okay, well, uh, yeah, there were definitely predecessors, but I think uh, they were the first to really do the numerics and see that it actually works in some sense. W which model was it successfully applied to? Which Saskia model? Okay, I I'm not familiar with it, but I could definitely be wrong. Yeah. Okay, sure. Uh, Okay, so uh, perhaps it was done earlier, but uh, at least for me, uh, I think it was uh, shown fairly convincingly that it was actually converging and so forth in this paper by Anderson and Krutensky. Uh And then uh, I studied this problem in 2020 uh, just for the simple case of the two matrix model where we really tried to uh, uh, show that the method, we developed the method a little bit more and tried to show that it uh, really would solve a model which was difficult to solve, okay? Uh, and then, uh, there are many other papers which uh, followed up on that work, uh, so I, I won't, I've listed some of them here. Um, but the interesting thing is actually uh, going all the way back, I think, to 1999, uh, Polchinski, uh, you could say, also used this method. So uh, predating all of these other papers that I've listed, uh, Polchinski actually, in 1999, uh, used some arguments to study, to give some analytic result about the BFSS model, right? And uh, using this uh, argument, he was able to uh, derive some lower bound on some simple correlators. And uh, looking back, we can recognize Polchinski's argument as a kind of bootstrap argument uh, in line with some of the more recent papers. So uh, I will kind of uh, discuss that a little bit today. So today we're here, uh, and well, yeah, uh, perhaps uh, Antal is telling us that uh, there are also some other references here. Uh, So, so um, that, that is uh, where we're headed. Uh, I would like to now explain how to apply the bootstrap in the, simplest, in the simplest possible context, which is just the one matrix model, okay? That's right, that's right, exactly. Uh, and I will review that argument in more detail, yeah. So uh, I will first start by just discussing the one matrix model. So this is, uh, an extremely simple large n limit, a uh, large n model, which uh, was solved many years ago analytically, but I will nevertheless explain how you use the bootstrap to reproduce the analytic solution, okay? And uh, you, you will see that uh, in this very simple context, the method is extremely dumb, and uh, a dumb is a good thing because it means that uh, you don't have to be smart to apply it uh, to more complicated models, okay? So, um, yeah. Okay, so the one matrix model. Um, we're going to consider n by n Hermitian matrices. It's a, it's a zero dimensional model. So all we want to do is compute something like the partition function, right? So this is just an integral over the uh, Hermitian matrix M, right? With some measure, right? And the measure is uh, the trace of some polynomial in M, okay? So this is the simplest uh, matrix theory that you could imagine. And it's been solved uh, via many methods. One, one method uh, which relates to what we heard yesterday is to go to the eigenvalue basis, uh, to, to introduce the eigenvalue distribution and then uh, analyze this model by saddle point, okay? But uh, today we're going to use uh, the bootstrap to solve it. So like with any bootstrap, uh, there are sort of two ingredients. 
Okay. One is positivity of some sort. And the second ingredient are some sort of constraints. And the idea is that using positivity and the constraints, we get many, many inequalities. And uh, if you have many inequalities, that's about as good as having equalities. Okay? So that's the idea of the bootstrap. Um, what it means in this context is the following. So, well, let's, let's ask two questions about this integral. First, uh, question zero, uh, does it actually exist? And if it exists, uh, we would like to compute its value, and in particular, we would like to compute you know, all uh, expectation values of traces of the matrix, right? So trace of m to the k. So we would like to compute all expectation values of uh, m to the k, right? if it exists. Now, question zero is actually not completely trivial, right? So if this was a generic polynomial, um, it might have the polynomial v might look like something like this, right, where it's unbounded below, right? So it's not obvious. If, v, if m were just a single variable, if it weren't an n by n Hermitian matrix, but if, it were if n is just equal to 1 or 2, then it would not exist if it were uh, unbounded. But in the large n limit, as n goes to infinity, it's actually possible that this integral makes some formal sense at n equals infinity, even though it doesn't exist at any finite n. Okay? And that's simply because the tunneling rates uh, from which the eigenvalues, which sit here, for them to tunnel out, you can actually, in the tip limit, show that uh, that's suppressed in n. So it's possible that at infinite n, this integral actually makes sense, even though at finite n, it doesn't make sense. Okay, so we would like to know, uh, for what values of the coupling does this thing exist? That is correct, yeah. Yeah, yes. Yeah. There's a, there's, that is a very important entropy term, and that is the one which pushes things up. So, and, and as you know, all these models that kind of have entropy. No. So you can very explicitly show, for example, at infinite n. He's right. I mean, it's, it doesn't exist formally, but if you, if you restrict to a particular region around the minimum, then uh, the old arguments of, uh, I think it was Parisi that put in, uh, yes. He said that if you put a barrier near that maximum, that it was insensitive to that barrier. Yeah, so, so what you can do is you can put a barrier here, right? Or you can put it right wherever you want, right? But the claim is that at infinite n, it, it does not depend on any details of the barrier. Exactly. Right? So therefore, it exists in some formal sense. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it exists in some formal sense at infinite n. Um, and important, it's actually important that it exists, uh, for example, at values of g, which, well, at values of this polynomial, which, uh, are unbounded from, from below. Yeah, but I think the real statement is it doesn't exist. But in the presence of a barrier, it's insensitive to the barrier. Well, at infinite n, I don't need to discuss the barrier. At finite n, I agree that the integral certainly doesn't exist. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of similar to field theory, right? We could we say a field theory exists, uh, meaning to say that it, um, of course, you could give a lattice regularization, which is like adding a barrier. But uh, to say that the field theory exists means to say that you do not need to discuss what barrier or what regularization you use. No, at infinite time, indeed, you have to discuss the barriers. It's very important. All the C equal one matrix model, that, that all, in every paper you'll see the barrier. It's kind of a word oscillator, that is the example. And uh, it makes some arguments, but you have to put in the barrier. Every, it's every, sensitive to the details of the barrier. At it's end. sensitive to the barrier. No, no, the tunneling rates go like e to the minus n. No, so Maybe, but every quantity you calculate is sensitive to the barrier. Yeah. You know, in you think all the double scaling models, papers, yes. you, you will look up on the C for one matrix quantum mechanics. They always have explicit to the barrier in the formulas, in the answers. Not only in the calculation, but in the answers, the barrier is there. Uh, so, I don't think that's correct. As far as I understand, I think it's equal to one. That's yeah, correct. That's told by Polchinski. Yes. But uh, I think he told it clearly. But for between c equal to zero. Yeah. For the c equal zero model, you don't need. It. I, I also think for the issue. I think. I think even for the c equals one and for well, even for BFSS, for example, uh, you don't need to put the regulator. So in BFSS, there's also this issue, right? But you don't need to. I mean, you could you could actually introduce a barrier which is like turning on a mass term, for example, which would stabilize this thing absolutely. 
And you're allowed to do that, but uh, you can explicitly show that uh, taking that uh, regulator away, uh, the model is well-defined uh, in the large and limit. In particular, in the C equals zero model, when you approach the, so, so there's some critical point, right, where the eigenvalues are almost filling up this potential. So it's sort of on the verge of being ill-defined, right? So uh, at that point, the perturb that actually, that point gives you the radius of convergence of perturbation theory, right? And uh, approaching that point is actually where you match to the continuum world sheet. Right? So it's actually very important that uh, this model I exists at infinite n, uh, at some values which are not, uh, you know, a totally stable potential. Otherwise, you would not uh, get a finite radius of convergence. And if you don't have a finite radius of convergence, you cannot approach the critical point, and then you would not match the, uh, you, you would not match um, the continuum string expectation. Right, so you usually approach, uh, when you take the double scaling limit, you approach uh, the model from the side from which it's well-defined, um, but yeah. Yes, 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 yes. So, so, so yes, uh, non-perturbative effects are not allowed uh, in my discussion because n is strictly infinite. But uh, yes, in, in particular, these uh, non-perturbative effects, which go like e to the minus n and so forth, are related to tunnelings of the eigenvalues out into this region. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Th this coefficient could. Yeah, in general, this whole thing could be. Well, yeah. I mean, even the yeah, even the prefactor could be an i, or it could be a negative. I mean, in general, there could be, depending on uh, the details of the model, you could get two i's, and then it'd be a minus sign and so forth. But uh, the point is just that uh, I'm working in the strict n goes to infinity limit, in which case all these terms would die. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, just a zero d model for simplicity. Uh, we we will discuss the quantum mechanical cases later. Yeah, t tunneling just means that, uh, well, uh, yeah, uh, it, it's not actually a tunneling because we're doing zero dimensions, but it just means that an eigenvalue, for example, if you were to sample this integral, most of the time it would stay in this region, but occasionally, uh, if you were to actually sample this integral, there would be an eigenvalue that escapes. Yeah, yeah it'd be like, it's like a thermal problem in statistical physics, which uh, is not well defined because uh, you, you need to know what happens to the eigenvalue when it starts to roll down in this direction. I mean, you, you can't do an integral. <laughs> I mean, I think this whole discussion is like, can you do an integral like this with, with uh, m cubed? Right? Clearly, this integral doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, you need to discuss how to make sense of an integral like this. But uh, my claim is that at infinite n, uh, you do not need to uh, discuss the details of how you make sense of the integral. But, uh, for example, you could change this potential by a small coefficient with a coefficient that, the, that gets smaller as n gets bigger. Right? And uh, as long as you do that in an insensible way, it will not depend on the details of uh, how you regulate that integral. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I didn't uh, understand. You can use it for double scale limit. Uh, you cannot use the, well, uh, I'm not going to explain how to use the bootstrap in the double scaling limit. I'm only going to study the strict tilt limit. So, in the <laughs> He's doing the naive large end. Yeah. I'm doing the yeah. naive large end. You, you could approach, so one can discuss, uh, you know, approaching the, 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 the boundary in which this potential makes sense, and then we would go to the double scaling limit and so forth. Yeah, then I'm not going to do that. Okay, but in double scaling limit, you always have well, ambiguity, right? That we cannot do. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I think, I think that's the ambiguity maybe Ankar was also talking about. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that's scaling right. limit, you that's need right. that thing. That's right, that's right, that's right. I, I agree with that. Uh. Okay, so, um, so what kind of positivity are we going to use? So I said that there are two ingredients. The first ingredient is a very simple thing, which is uh, positivity of the measure, basically. So that, in particular, implies that things like trace of m to some positive integer, uh, to some positive even power, uh, has to be positive. Right? And a slightly more general version of this statement is that if we consider O to be any superposition of matrices, right, 
then a trace of O dagger O, the expectation value of this has to be positive. Right? So this equation can be written uh, as follows. So we consider now a matrix of correlators. This matrix is not related to M, it's a matrix of correlators. The first, uh, we write down a list of possible matrices. So 1, M, M squared, et cetera. 1, M, M squared, M cubed, et cetera. And we fill out this matrix as follows. So 1 here goes here, M goes here, M squared. Uh, and we compute the traces of these. We, we put correlators uh, in the entries. So here uh, we have an M and an M, so we have trace M squared. And on the diagonal, we'll have all the even powers, right? Uh, trace M to the 4, et cetera. Right, so this is the inner product matrix um, that's obtained by looking at correlators like this. And the claim is that this matrix, this matrix of correlators, oh, this is the inner product matrix, it's symmetric and so forth, it, it's positive semi-definite. That means all of its eigenvalues are positive. Okay? So um, we would like, we know no matter what, if this integral actually makes sense, uh, it better be that all of the correlators that it produces satisfy this condition. Okay? That is a very simple positivity constraint that we're going to use. Now, what are the constraints? So the constraints are what, we, are what is known in the literature as loop equations. So these are nothing but the Schwinger-Dyson equations applied in the context of matrix integrals. Okay, so uh, I will explain this very simply in this model. So the idea is you consider some correlator, trace of m to the k, let's say. You write it as a sum over Feynman diagrams. You can think of it like that. And you follow one of the arrows into the blob. Okay, so you follow one of the external lines into the blob. So there are two things that can possibly happen. One thing that can happen is it encounters no vertex. Okay, so I follow this line in and it somehow encounters no vertex. If that's the case, then it splits the diagram into two pieces, right? So if this were trace m to the k, then we would have a term which involves trace m to the l, trace m to the n, let's say, where um, l plus n is equal to k minus two, right? So We've split the blob into two pieces. We've lost two of the external lines because here are the two of the external lines. So we have L plus N is equal to K minus two, okay? And uh, here we've used the large N limit, right? So in general, there could be Feynman diagrams which involve lines that go from here to here. But since we're in the tuft limit, uh, all such diagrams must be planar, okay? So if they're planar diagrams, that means that you cannot have a line that comes from here and uh, crosses this line and goes over here because it, it wouldn't, you can't draw such a line on the plane, okay? So that tells you that uh, the expectation value of these double traces factorize. And then we have one more term. So um, the other term happens when the uh, external line encounters a vertex, right? So this accounts for all Feynman diagrams where you do not encounter any vertex. There's one more term uh, where that external line encountered some vertex. And if it encounters some vertex, of course, it can make more external lines. So we will have some term that could involve some coupling G, trace M to the K, let's say plus two, right? So if it, uh, so depending on the degree of the polynomial, uh, let's say the polynomial V was just trace M squared uh, plus G trace M to the fourth, right? Then we would have some extra term here, um, which involves a higher trace, okay? So this is the loop equations in the context of the one matrix model, okay? And the only thing I would like to point out is that it is a recursion relation in uh, K. So in particular, if we know the first few moments of uh, trace M to the K, right? So suppose we know uh, the expectation value of M squared, right? Then by using this equation, we can generate more and more traces, right? We can generate trace M to the fourth, trace M to the sixth, trace M to the eighth, et cetera, right? So by, uh, this, these sets of constraints tell us that if we know um, something simple, we can get something more and more complicated. And in particular, if we, uh, if we assume we know some, some small block of this matrix, let's say trace M and trace M squared, uh, depending on the degree of the polynomial, you'll need to know uh, the search space, the amount of information that you need to know in the beginning will depend on the model slightly. But the basic idea is you need to know a small number of correlators 
And then using the loop equations, you can fill out this entire matrix. Uh, which coefficients? These coefficients? Yeah, Th that, that comes from this argument. So uh, I've assumed that the propagator, the free propagator is one. Yeah. So I've normalized the potential so that the kinetic term, so that th this trace, uh, th this free propagator is just one. If you put some coefficient here, you would adjust this coefficient right here. So, um, so the Combining these two ingredients, we have the following strategy. First, you guess what some of the low order correlators are. So in this simple context, you just tell me what the value you think trace m squared is. Right? Then I try to determine whether you're lying. So I do that by plugging your guess into this loop equations and generating infinitely, or maybe not infinite, but maybe a thousand values of trace m to the k. Right? So I, based on your answer for what trace m squared is, I can generate what trace m to the fourth is, what trace m uh, to the thousand is, right? Then I plug it into this matrix and I calculate all the eigenvalues of this matrix. If I find that any of those eigenvalues are negative, I can rule out your guess. Right? So by iterating this simple procedure, you repeat a different guess to me. You say, uh, I think trace m squared is equal to you know, 0.3. I plug this value of 0.3 into this matrix and I find, oh, there's a negative eigenvalue. That's impossible. Then you try, okay, maybe it's 0.4. Uh, and then I repeat the procedure. By iterating that procedure, <laughs> I can rule out uh, what trace m squared is. Okay, so um, let me make a plot. Yeah. So as a function of g, the coupling, right? I can. Uh, consider trace m squared, right? And there's some known exact answer. Okay, let's say this is the known exact answer. So as the coupling gets larger, trace m squared decreases. But I don't know, I, I don't need to know the exact solution. I simply, you know, at some particular g, I per perform this procedure and I rule out all of these points, right? So if trace m squared is too big, I will find some negative eigenvalue. And so I derive some, I can end up deriving some lower and upper bounds on trace m squared. Okay, and then I repeat that for different values of the coupling. So I generate some uh, plot that looks like this, right? Some plot that has some lower bound and some upper bound. And if you just do this in Mathematica for, you know, uh, maybe up to trace of m to the 10th or trace of m to the 20 or 30, you will see it rapidly converges to the <coughs> exact solution. Yes? Right, right, right. So I think several people, I think, for example, Kazakov and Zeng studied this a little bit more. Uh, I gave a heuristic argument in the one matrix case that it has to converge. Um, I can give you the heuristic argument. Uh, and you can actually just start with the value of this. Yes, yeah, you could. Yeah. So, uh, yes. Um, uh, l let me continue for one second, then I'll present the heuristic argument. Okay, so. Uh, so, so um, one question you can ask now is what happens at negative values of g, right? So remember, the potential is uh, m to the fourth, right? So negative values of g means the potential looks something like this, right? So it is not uh, well-defined at finite n. But at infinite n, we know that the exact solution can be extended. It, it, it's analytic, and it's analytic up to some point, which uh, in some conventions is g equals minus 112. Okay, so you can just ask the bootstrap, please continue, I mean, uh, see what happens in this region. And the bootstrap is very happy. In fact, if you take some value, let's say g equals minus uh, you know, one, you will find that there's no value of trace m squared that is allowed. So the model's just inconsistent at some sufficiently negative values of g. And as you continue to closer and closer to the known uh, non-analytic, uh, this critical value, what you will find is that the bootstrap will produce upper and lower bounds that converge uh, to that point, right? So the allowed region, is a peninsula and it's shrinking and it's, it's wrapping that uh, exact solution at g equals minus 112, okay? Um, so <clears throat> that means you have no extreme, no position with, with Yes, like yes, that. yes, so it does. It was shown that there is one Yes, yes, that's right, that's right. So that's right. Yes, I mean, I haven't uh, studied it for all possible polynomials, but for the two-cut matrix model, for example, yeah. it works. 
So in particular, here there's uh, one solution only, right? But uh, in general, uh, you could have a situation like uh, the double well, right? Uh, the double well, which looks like this, right? And then you have actually a moduli of solution, as uh, I think you were alluding to. So you can have some filling fraction, right? Um, and the model actually finds that filling fraction. So it, it's, it shows that all this filling fraction, let's say, goes from zero to one. If it's zero, all the eigenvalues are on one side. If it's one, let's say, all the eigenvalues are on the right side. Yeah. And the model will actually find a value of uh, trace m squared in some, higher dimension, in some higher dimensional search space, which is a line, which corresponds to that filling fraction. That so makes you, sense. You can pick one, uh, one or, 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 all of them are consistent. Yeah. All of them are allowed, yeah. yes. So it, instead of converging to a point, it converges to a little segment in uh, higher dimension. Um, and based on the heuristic argument, uh, I expect that to work for general. So let me present the heuristic argument. So the idea is, when would this method actually work? Right? It, you would expect that this method would work if there are many eigenvalues that are very close to zero for the exact solution. Right? That means that if the exact solution has zero eigenvalues, that means that perturbing the exact solution even slightly will make this matrix negative, which would mean that you could rule it out. Okay, so if, the, if you evaluate this matrix on the exact solution and you find zero eigenvalues or nearly zero eigenvalues, then you would expect that this bootstrap approach would work. So the heuristic argument is that there always exists negative eigenvalues, uh, sorry, zero, nearly zero eigenvalues of this matrix. And uh, you can, it's not so difficult to see why. So in particular, if we look at the exact solution for some polynomial, which is a quartic, we will get some eigenvalue distribution like this, right? So this is now rho, rho of lambda as a function of lambda. Right? And it has compact support. If it has compact support, we can find a polynomial in lambda, right? Which is almost zero in this region, but does something crazy in some other region, right? As we increase the degree of the polynomial, we will have to higher and higher precision a function like the one that I just described. That's nearly zero in the compact region in which the eigenvalues have support and is non-zero outside. So such a polynomial will have zero expectation value, right? If we find such a polynomial, P of lambda, then its expectation value will be zero according to this measure, right? So that actually is enough to argue that this matrix evaluated on the exact solution will have null vectors, okay? So in part, yeah, so that, Using this polynomial, you can construct some combination of traces, which when you go to a very high degree, will have nearly zero eigenvalues. And that shows you that the exact solution is on the boundary of what is the allowed region according to this positivity constraint. So if you're on the boundary of the allowed region, then perturbing it even slightly, you will be able to rule out the constraint. So that, that's the heuristic argument. And I believe that uh, Kazakov and Zeng and some other authors, maybe uh, you actually, uh, uh, studied this in more detail. Uh, Uh, I would have to think about it more carefully, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yes, I've heard this claim, right, right, yeah. I've heard this claim, yeah. So this heuristic argument doesn't give you a rate uh, estimate, but. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, let me see. Uh, uh, okay, yeah. Yeah, you have to make sure that it's positive, I guess, is one. The, the, po the polynomial has to be a positive polynomial. It has to be the, roughly a square or something. Yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. That probably will work. I have to think about it, but I think you're right, yeah. Um, okay, so that, that's the idea for the one matrix model. For the two matrix model, we do something very similar. So the positivity just now involves more complicated combinations of M, 
right? So if we had two matrices A and B, uh, it's now, we, we have to consider all possible words involving A and B, right? So we could have A, B, A, B, A, B, A, you know, A squared, B squared, et cetera. So it's now much more complicated. This uh, positivity matrix is much bigger. It's much more complicated. But in principle, we still have some positivity constraints. We still have the loop equations. We can try to plug in uh, the loop equations based on some simple guesses and repeat the procedure. And uh, this was, you know, argued that it might work in my paper. And I think it was really demonstrated quite convincingly in this paper by Kazakov and Zhang. So they studied some more complicated models that really could not be solved analytically. And they got uh, very high precision estimates of uh, various correlators. So by high precision, I mean several, yeah. It seems hard to imagine that like high precision estimates of various correlators were given. Okay, okay, thanks. Yes, what, my only claim is that Kazakov and Zhang computed some correlators to like five precision, five decimal digits or something, and uh, there's no other method that I know. Of. Yeah. Yeah, that's a... Yeah, that's a good question. I, I would imagine that it's conceptually quite similar, but um, I mean, you would need to impose, so here we use the hermeticity, right, in also writing this, and you would have to, you know, massage it a little bit more, but uh, I would imagine that something analogous would work. Yeah, so they computed some low correlators, like uh, trace of AB or trace of uh, A squared, some simple correlators involving two matrices, and they computed them to high precision. Um, and with, with the modeling, the modeling between the... Uh, yeah, C times trace AB could be solved uh, relatively easily, but they considered more complicated potentials. So things that are quartic, for example, in A and B. I think they did, uh, I think commutator squared can actually be solved analytically um, for two matrices. For higher matrices, it cannot be solved. But there's actually some trick for solving, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, just because, well, so commutator squared is actually uh, quadratic in one of the A's, right? So you could integrate out the A's exactly, right? Because it's just a Gaussian integral. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but but yeah, there's some small number of tricks that work, right? And then the general potential nobody knows how to solve. And they picked one that uh, apparently you do not know how to solve, and they they use this method to solve it. Okay. Uh, yeah. So now I'm going to jump to quantum mechanics. So that was uh, done in this paper by Han Hartnell and Krutoff. Okay. So um, the quantum mechanical case, I think. Uh, ah, thanks. Okay, I maybe I'll let you. <laughs> uh, yeah, this one would be good. Yeah. Yeah, I should also mention that uh, Kazakov and Zhang made one conceptual improvement, I think, to this method, which is they used uh, relaxation. So they convert, so the loop equations are quadratic equations, right? They involve, uh, you know, uh, products of things. And that is very annoying because you would like to do a semi-definite programming problem. You would like a, a standard semi-definite programming problem, but you have a bunch of quadratic constraints. So that uh, is not a standard uh, linear programming problem. So instead, they use this method called relaxation. And relaxation, basically, the idea is that you introduce new variables. So if you have something like x squared equals y, right? You uh, invent a new variable for x squared. Uh, so you could call it y, right? And um, instead of imposing, well, this thing, okay, the equation that you actually wanted was, let's say, something like this, right? So x squared equals ax plus b. You invent a new variable y, and instead of writing this equation, you just set y 
is greater than x squared. Right? So it's still a rigorous statement. So you remove this equation, right? but you keep this one. So it's still a rigorous statement, but the advantage is that you can repackage this into a matrix inequality. Right? So essentially, uh, you, know, you could consider a matrix, let's see, uh, maybe something like this. Right? And positive semi-definiteness of this matrix implies that y is greater than x squared. Right? So um, instead of using imposing the loop equations as equalities, they impose them as inequalities. But the advantage is that it's a completely standard linear SDP problem, and then you can use the same methods that, let's say, the conformal bootstrap people did. Right? And you can impose a huge number of inequalities, and uh, that's what allowed them also to get this uh, high-precision estimate. Yes, yes, it does. it does. So that is a downside of the bootstrap, uh, which is especially in matrix models with many matrices, like two or three. <laughs> <laughs> Even uh, in the cases of two or three matrices, the number of correlators grows exponentially. Right? So you need a very big matrix in principle. Um, luckily, the convergence seems to be related to the number of constraints that you impose, rather than, you know. So there's no rigorous argument that I know of in the multi-matrix case. But empirically, it seems that you can get high precision estimates uh, using reasonable things that you can put on a computer. Um, yeah, so they use like a couple of hours of computation on a laptop or something. But, but in quantum mechanics, let's say we have a conjugate variable P and X. So you could think of those as uh, some number of matrices. Right, right, yes. Yes, that, that, that is an important point. That is an important point, yes. Yes, so, so uh, Han, Hartnell, and Krutoff uh, got around this problem. So, uh, so I will now explain what they did to get around the problem. And the simple idea is instead of working, yeah, so in principle, you have all these correlators evaluated at different times. I think that's what you're saying. And that gives you infinitely many matrices. So it sounds very difficult to, uh, actually, uh, to actually try to do this numerically. And that actually plagued some of the earlier work. So Anderson and Kuchansky, for example, uh, they just discretized time and they discretized space and they tried to apply the loop equations on this uh, lattice, right? But uh, Hahn, Hartnell, and Krutoff, just in the quantum mechanical case, said that there's a simple way, uh, which is just to use the Hamiltonian formulation as opposed to the Lagrangian formulation. So when you do the Hamiltonian formulation, um, you just consider correlators like trace of x and p and so forth. Right? So potentially in different orders. Right, if you have uh, different matrices, there would be Px and Py. You could have complicated correlators like this, but you always evaluate them in some particular state. So the goal now is to evaluate uh, some correlator in some particular state like this. Okay, And uh, what they said was you can replace the two things that we talked about, positivity and constraints, with something which respects the structure very nicely. And the idea is that positivity Instead of positivity of the measure, okay, you replace it with positivity of the Hilbert space inner product. Okay? And that always exists, of course, in quantum mechanics, even if you have fermions. So you use the Hilbert space inner product uh, for positivity. And for the second thing, instead of using the loop equations, you use the simple equation that the commutator of the Hamiltonian with some operator in a state like the energy eigenstate, E, has to vanish. Right? So just expanding this, this is H O H X on E, that gives you E, uh, you know, O H H X on E, and that gives you E. So you end up, you know, this is obvious, this is an obvious equation, right? But um, the point is that using the canonical commutation relations between H and the operator, you generate higher point functions starting from lower point functions, right? So instead of using, the, the idea is kind of similar to the loop equations, but it's technically a lot simpler. You just use the canonical commutation relations to start acting with the Hamiltonian on simple operators, and you will generate more and more higher point functions starting from lower point functions. So then, uh, well, uh, just to be a little bit more explicit for one, you again consider you know, uh, some matrix now that involves, let's say, x, p, x, p, um, x squared, p, et cetera, right? Uh, x, p, x, p, et cetera. And you make a matrix of correlators like we did before or you think of P as sort of a different matrix, right? And requiring positivity of this thing is equivalent to requiring Hilbert space positivity of the inner product in quantum mechanics. And uh, as I've already emphasized, this is a nice thing to do because it also gets around the sign problem. 
So uh, in a theory where you have some fermionic matrices in addition to bosonic matrices, uh, the measure is no longer positive necessarily. Or if you're trying to, if you're interested in some Lorentzian time problem, there's no guarantee that there's a positive measure. But here you just have the Hilbert space inner product, and that's positive. Period. Right? Um, you also have the uh, the, the states. Like you have these operators, and you also have yes. This is actually bigger. Like correct, correct. Yeah, so let me, let me discuss that a little bit. So uh, there's one question, which is how do you pick out the particular energy, right? Based on what I've said, this applies to any energy eigenstate. In fact, it, it applies to any state rho such that, uh, well, if you had, you just need to impose this equation, right? And this basically implies that if, if rho commutes with h, it doesn't even have to be energy eigenstate. You can have any mixed state that commutes with h, uh, this equation, would be satisfied, right? So um, how do you pick out a particular energy? Okay, well, one idea is you simply consider the expectation value of H, right? And if you consider the expectation value of H, you could try to minimize H, the, the, this expectation value, and that would pick out, let's say, the ground state. That's one idea. Another idea is you could just try to fix the average energy of the uh, density matrix by putting this not as a variable in which you're optimizing over by just picking its value. Okay, um, if you wanted a microcanonical window where you really fix an energy eigenstate, well, in principle, you need to consider h of to the n, right, and impose that that's equal to e to the n, right? But at large n, because of factorization, you can often get a, not you can often get away without using this equation because of large n factorization. Uh, as long as you assume factorization, right, h of some trace things, you don't usually need to impose double trace conditions uh, on your Things. You only need to impose a single trace equation. Okay, so uh, I will discuss this in a moment, actually. Yes. yes. Okay, yes. The, the, Okay, yes, yes. The, well, no, I didn't give up on it. Because, well, uh, you're right that I haven't explained how I use the large n limit yet. No, no, we will we'll be very systematic. And the systematic equation that we will say is that all double traces and triple traces and so forth factorize. So let me explain how that equation is actually used. Yes, okay. Okay. Uh, but let me just say one, uh, one thing. So why do you actually need to use the double trace factorization condition? So the, the thing that you, you need, the reason why that comes up is if you consider a simple correlator like trace x squared, x cubed p, for example. This is actually related to something like trace of p x cubed, right? Um, yeah, you can simply try to commute p through x's, right? When you do such an exercise, you don't just get uh, this equation, but you actually generate terms like trace p, trace p, right? When you move the x through the p's. So um, the equation that's exact is this. But in order to assume large n, we then further impose that this correlator factorizes. So that's the only step which uses infinite n. And that, uh, this large n factorization that we impose is what tells the model that we're at infinite n. Uh, the, the equations that involve, the equations that you get from H commutated with O, if O is a single trace operator itself, it preserves a single trace condition. So it does not generate double traces. So the, the place where you actually use double traces is this equation. And this, is, again, gives you the quadratic equation. So structurally, it's very similar to uh, the loop equations in the sense that you have a bunch of quadratic uh, constraints that you need to then deal with. Okay. So uh, I will, for... Brevity, I will just jump directly to uh, the BFSS model. So 
uh, previously, it was, I think it was believed that uh, we are still many years away from using this kind of bootstrap philosophy to actually extract anything interesting about black holes or BFSS. And the reason was what I just said. Uh, the BFSS model has many matrices. So in particular, there's an SO9 symmetry of the BFSS model. It means it has nine bosonic matrices and 16 fermionic matrices. So that's quite a lot of matrices, and it doesn't seem very uh, feasible to try to use this method, which was already being pushed to its limit uh, with two or three matrices uh, to a model which has that many matrices. Um, but the uh, upside is that there's an SO9 symmetry. So in many ways, the different matrices are not, uh, it's not so clear whether you should count those matrices as different or not or whatever. Um, and so in a paper that uh, I wrote relatively recently, um, we applied this, we did the dumbest possible bootstrap study. We didn't even do numerics. We just did some analytic constraints. Um, uh, along the lines of what I already explained here. Um, and we derive some simple bounds on correlators in the BFSS model. Now, um, one thing that we discovered uh, once we started doing this exercise was that some of the constraints actually already appeared in the literature. And in particular, they were derived by Polchinski using virial arguments. So now I will just quickly explain uh, what Polchinski did. So basically, he used these exact constraints, although he said it slightly differently. So in particular, he used th this constraint uh, in the ground state of BFSS, okay, where O um, is some, you can choose many different things for O, but in particular, you can choose to consider O equals trace X squared or O equals trace XP. Okay. That's the Vera one, exactly. This is the second one. The first one gives you the uncertainty principle, mm -hmm. right? So uh, you get the uncertainty principle, you get the Vera argument, you combine them, you use some, a bunch of uh, uh, matrix inequalities that all derived from this kind of positivity, and you get some bound on trace x squared in the ground state. So uh, actually, slightly more precisely, you get a bound on trace x to the fourth in the ground state. Okay, so you get some, uh, some uh, what well, you know that this thing has to be greater than zero, and you also uh, derive some non-trivial inequality from this kind of reasoning. Okay, and what was interesting was there was some arguments in the 1990s, apparently, on what the size of the ground state wave function is in uh, M-theory, right? So in this BFSS model, it's related to this uh, uh, particular black hole that uh, I want to discuss for the sake of time. But um, people were wondering just the, the simplest possible question. I have some ground state of this matrix quantum mechanics. What is, let's say, the value of trace x squared or trace x to the fourth or some simple things like this? And there was no solid argument for even the n scaling of this uh, quantity. People debated whether it was n to the one ninth or what exactly the power of n was. And Polchinski's argument nailed the correct power, okay? And uh, in retrospect, it was just a straightforward application of this kind of method. Now, uh, once you recognize that, you can go further. So you can consider more operators. So that's basically what I did. I just looked at a couple more operators, and I looked at also some fermionic operators. And by doing so, one actually gets a bound not just on trace x to the fourth, but uh, also trace x squared, for example, uh, and also things like uh, trace of the commutator, if you like. Okay, so one can get bounds on things like this, and well, I, I can, I refer you to the paper for the details um, for the sake of time, but you can plot, let's say, trace x squared um, as a function now also of energy. So Polchinski did this argument at e equals zero. Um, e equals zero uses supersymmetry, right? But uh, in general, you can study the model at any energy, right? And that's related at finite energies or finite temperatures. It's expected to be related to a black hole in type 2a. Okay, so it's some particular type 2a solution. And um, studying correlation functions in this background probes properties of the black hole, okay? So we would like to be able to compute things like trace x squared or other simple correlators in this uh, black hole background or in this uh, finite energy microcanonical uh, window and compare it, let's say, to the supergravity, okay? Um, we're not there yet, of course, but the method allows you to derive some non-trivial inequalities uh, on what, let's say, trace x squared is as a function of energy. And uh, what's kind of interesting is, as a function of energy, you get some, uh, some lower bound on what trace x squared could be. And you can compare this to the Monte Carlo results. So the Monte Carlo results, um, well, one thing is that they lie above the bound. Okay, that's a good thing. But uh, what's kind of interesting is that the discrepancy between the Monte Carlo results and our estimates are only about a factor of two. Okay, and this was just using some very simple uh, constraints along the lines of what Polchinski did, right? We just considered a couple of O's. Um, 
so it was actually a very sort of straightforward uh, thing that you could do by hand. If you did numerics, the hope would be that you could push this upper bound much, uh, you know, you'd get a much better uh, lower bound on this particular quantity, and it might compete with the Monte Carlo estimates uh, that were obtained by uh, Masanori and uh, his collaborators. So um, uh, that is one thing that you can ask. Another thing uh, you can ask is it overcomes the sign problem. So uh, this is a model with uh, fermions, and we actually use the fermions uh, to a great deal in order to get this bound on trace x squared. So in particular, um, if you want, I'll write the Hamiltonian. Okay. Uh, it has uh, a sum over i, where i runs from 1 to 9. There's also a commutator term, xi, xj squared. Okay. Um, and then there's also a fermionic term, which is important for the supersymmetry of the model. Okay. Uh, it involves an x and two psi's. So it's actually uh, like x commutator to psi. And then there's some indices, there's some SO9 indices that are contracted with the appropriate gamma, the gamma matrices to make this thing an SO9 singlet. Okay, so this is the Hamiltonian of the model. Um, Polchinski basically eliminated the fermion term and just studied the constraints you get from the boson. But the fermionic term uh, as a simple form that is just quadratic in the size and linear in the x, right? So in particular, since these are Majorana fermions, if the fermionic term gets very big, right, the Majorana terms are bounded. So the only way for the fermionic term to get big is if the x term gets very big, right? Uh, psi squared is roughly one, right, in some, I mean, of course, there's some n floating around, so you have to worry about those factors of n, but psi squared you can think of as roughly one. So in order for the fermionic term to get big, that tells you something about x. And that's actually how you get this non-trivial constraint on trace x squared is by using some details of that particular fermionic term. My, my main point, though, is just that we did something extremely dumb. Like, we only looked at some very simple correlation functions and used things like commutator of x and p and, uh, you know, anti-commutator of psi and psi is 1. You know, some very stupid equations like this. And we were able to get something which is somewhat non-trivial. So uh, my expectation is that uh, uh, if we do actual numerics, um, along the lines of, let's say, what uh, Kazakov and Zeng did and uh, others, um, for, potentially we might be able to compute uh, to relatively high precision some simple correlation functions at finite energies uh, in this model. And I should say also that the bounds that we get, they depend on some scale, lambda, uh, which in some appropriate units, uh, there's some dimensionless coupling E. Uh, so, so, sorry, the energy here can be combined with lambda in such a way um, such that we get a dimensionless quantity. And the bounds are naturally a function of that dimensionless quantity. Now, uh, in supergravity, that dimensionless quantity is what controls the supergravity approximation. So when that dimensionless quantity becomes close to one, the supergravity approximation breaks down, and you really need uh, string theory in order to predict even the semi-classical properties of the black hole. Right? So even the Bekenstein Hawking formula is no longer reliable at energies that are large in this dimension when you use the appropriate units. Okay, so the point is that by studying this, we can uh, interpolate between the regime in which supergravity is reliable and let's say some higher energy regimes where you need string theory. And hopefully at least uh, maybe it's slightly futuristic, but uh, maybe in the next couple of years, one can try to uh, understand these estimates a little bit better. And as a conservative goal, I think we could at least just test the Monte Carlo results that were obtained uh, uh, by various authors. Uh, who made some, uh, let's say, approximations to deal with the sign problem. So by using this bootstrap method, which uh, rigorously treats the sign problem, we can at least uh, provide some sort of check that uh, these Monte Carlo methods are completely correct. Okay. Uh, we should use so, supersymmetry, because they, it, it's supersymmetric, so... That's right. So we can also use supersymmetry. So another thing that we could do is instead of saying H commutator O, we could just put the supercharge, Q alpha commutator O, and uh, apply that to the ground state, right? So uh, in the ground state, an equation like this, or potentially with anti-commutators, we have O being a fermion, uh, also applies. And therefore, we could uh, probe the... Well, potentially, one could try to probe the, the ground state properties, uh, you know, using these kind of constraints. You didn't try that. Well, we did not try that. Well, I, I did try it actually uh, choosing some simple operators and I got the same things as just using H, but I suspect that's only because I tried the first few. Once you have more, you obviously should expect many more constraints uh, from supersymmetry than just the, applying the commutator of H with the Thanks very much. Okay.